my pleasure to welcome you for the second session this morning. My name is Anna Wienhardt. I'm a professor of mathematics here at the University of Heidelberg and at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies and a member of the scientific committee of the HLF. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker of the second session, Gregory Mergulis, who got his Fields Medal in 1978 for his work on the innovative analysis of the structure of Lie groups. He has actually influenced mathematics in many other ways, introducing ergodic theory in the study of number theory, and also in constructing one of the first known expanders, uh, a theory which became quite popular in mathematics and theoretical computer science, and in his talk he will tell us about the early history of expanders. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So it's my first time when I participate in Heidelberg Forum. So now theory of expanders is quite, is very popular. And so I have a colleague at Yale, Dan Spielman, who is one of the winners of the Uh, of Neva Lina Prize, and he's at computer science department, and he once gave a colloquium talk at, in the mathematics department, and if I remember correctly, he said that after calculus, the theory of expanders is the most important contribution by mathematicians to theoretical computer science. So it's, yeah, probably it's an exaggeration, but it's just, I, I want to mention that. So from, so it's, uh, initially the, uh, the theory of expanders was motivated by certain problems in telephone network theory. And so there was a, was a paper by Mark Pinsker, which is on the complexity of concentrator from 1973, which he constructed concentrators with certain properties. And one of the main building blocks was the expanders. So maybe let me start with the definition of a concentrator. So there is some parameters attached to this notion. So NM concentrator is a graph with there's N inputs, NM outputs, and such that, so M is less than N, such that if we choose any M inputs, then they can be connected by non-intersecting paths to the outputs. Or in other ways, so if we choose M inputs, then there is a paths which, okay, non so each input is connected to some output and there by some path and these paths are the joint. Okay, so it follows from the definition of the this NM concentrate if we choose any K inputs where K is not greater than M then the k paths which starts of this k inputs and they will be non intersecting and which end at outputs but it's not so it's not claimed that this k output somehow it will be something which we can prescribe before Okay, so now there is a, 
So, so the notion of concentrated somehow was motivated by some problems in telephone network theory. Now, there is a somewhat related notion which is called a super concentrator and it was, was introduced by Pippinger in 1977. So the uh, super concentrator is a graph where we have the same number inputs and outputs, so n inputs and n outputs, such that you would take any k, you would fix some k which is less than, not greater than n, and take k inputs and k outputs that they can be connected by non-intersecting paths. So it means that we start with each of these k inputs, then draw some, can draw some paths to outputs, uh, which will be in this fixed in this chosen set of k outputs and this path should be the joint. Yeah, so it's, yeah, the notion of the super concentrate in some sense is more elegant and more symmetric, so it's somehow there's a, you can interchange inputs, inputs and outputs. Yes, so it's, yeah, now, now some, re, uh, some remarks about these connections between super concentrators and concentrators. So if we have a super concentrator with, okay, n inputs and n outputs, and if we choose some, any m which is not greater than n, and then fix some, and then choose some subset of outputs, choose some M outputs, and just forget about other outputs, then we, it's clear that we get an M concentrator. But, yeah, and so actually this NM concentrator, which we obtain, has some additional property, which is if we fix some K, which is K is, see, K is not greater than M, and choose some K inputs, and then choose the another k outputs from this nm concentrator then we can connect this chosen k inputs with chosen k outputs by non intersecting paths so this is somehow additional property which we didn't have in the definition of nm concentrator in and then concentrated, we chose a set of K inputs. Somehow they can be connected to outputs by the, the joint paths, but what we get at the end somehow is not fixed. So it's... Yeah, no, so now it's somehow it's because we have this additional property which we usually don't have in NM concentrators, it's kind, it's not likely that 
super concentrator can be obtained by some uh, tri by some obvious construction from concentrators. So it's you know. So it's as I said, super concentrators is kind of maybe more symmetric, more elegant, and somehow it's. And it's so, so it's a really a kind of generalization or, or related notion to, to the concentrator with some additional properties. Okay, so n now it's. So it was. Went down? Okay. Now it's somehow one of the problems in theory of concentrators and. Super concentrators is to find some good upper bounds for the number of edges in this concentrators and super concentrators. And so the, the, this is, was the problem which Pinsker considered in the paper which was mentioned at the beginning. So it's, yeah, actually quite uh, uh, most of this historical information which I now describe was provided to me by Leonid Basaliga, who was my colleague at the Institute of Problems in Information Transmission and He's maybe four years older than me, and he sent me some historical notes. And he, he was a close collaborator of Mark Pinsker, and also he was a, one of the last students of Komogorov. And so apparently the Basaviga told Pinsker about this problem of finding concentrators with smallest now okay to get some upper bounds on the number of edges which should be in the concentrator in a concentrator so at that time so it probably it's about 1971 uh, it was known that so you will denote this minimum number by C of n, then this, okay, there's a low estimate, which is kind of obvious, but there's upper estimate that C of n is not greater than 4n log n. So this upper bound, uh, probably as Basile wrote to me, is uh, follows from some earlier results which were obtained independently in mid-60s by Hoffman and Benish. Okay, so now, so there is this factor, okay, log n, and somehow Pinsker was able to eliminate this factor, and he showed that this, this C of n is actually is not greater than Cn, where 
C is not greater than 29. Maybe by now it's known there's some better estimates for this constant. Okay, now I'll just, now we, we can go to expanders. So the Pinsker construction actually quite ingenious and so it presents some kind of multi-level scheme, multi-level graph, but kind of the building block is uh, so what Pinsky called NRM expanders. So it's NRM expander is a, a bipartite graph with N inputs and R outputs. So it's, okay, so R is between M and N. So M is less than R and R is less than N. With the following property. So for every K, which is not greater than M, we, so R, so we can connect, sorry. There are connected paths with at least K. And so they can connect it with K outputs. No, are connected with at least K outputs. So it's yeah. So uh, yeah. So actually. So why it's called an expander? Because it's, so how we have the same K inputs and the same out number of outputs. So it's, in some sense, there was no expansion. But one has to notice that this R is less than N. So the relative size of this, of outputs actually will be bigger than the relative size of inputs. So it's in, uh, so Pinsker used this definition for this notion of, uh, of okay, MRN expander to construct concentrators. Now, for some other problems in so, like super concentrators, and also construction of N non blocking schemes. So Basalega, Pinsker, and Pippinger used more elaborate definition of an expander. And so this is the following, so it's it's a, so we consider a bipartite graph with N inputs and mu N outputs where mu is between zero and infinity. And so this bipartite graph is called alpha better expander, so it's alpha is less than one, 
so it's muis between alpha and beta if any k inputs where k is not greater than alpha n so we choose some portion of the inputs are connected with at least beta k outputs so we have so here we really have it's clear that here, here we have expansion. Now it's... So, so, so this was initially there was alpha, beta, expanders and there was this mu. Now it's usually assumed that mu is 1, that in the theory of expanders. So we have the same number of inputs and outputs and in this case, so it's we can actually say so we have the same number of inputs and outputs, we can identify inputs and outputs, and then it's, we can somehow reformulate uh, the notion of an expander. And so, in, so under the assumption that uh, number of inputs and number of outputs is the same, so it can be, uh, and we have this identification, then we can say that alpha beta expander is, so where alpha is between 0 and 1, and beta is greater than 1, is a finite non-oriented graph with n vertices and with the following property that every set of k vertices, so k is again is not greater than alpha n, it's connected with at least beta minus 1 multiplied by k of vertices outside of this set K. So maybe some, some explanation. So we have this non-oriented graph. So then for every set, subset of vertices, we can define some kind of a notion of a boundary. So boundary will be actually is not in the set, but it will be all vertices outside of the set, which are connected by an edge by with some element from the set. And so then there is this property that every he would take this. So every set of k vertices, the k is less than alpha n, so the number of vertices in the boundary will be at least beta minus 1 multiplied by k. So it's now actually by expanders, Okay, so there's uh, many variations in the definition, uh, okay, definition of an expander, and actually, for example, Lubotsky in his book, 
uses the, on expanders, uses the definition where alpha is one half and, okay, then beta is kind of one plus some epsilon and use this definition with the boundary. Now, one of the main problems in the theory of expanders is to give an estimate on the number of edges, uh, upper estimate on the number of edges in the, this alpha beta expanders. So it turns out that for every alpha, beta, and mu, which we d defined before, one can find the constant C, which is, okay, depends on alpha, beta, and mu, and such that for there's an infinite set in the infinitely many ends such that we can construct alpha beta expander with n inputs and mu n outputs and with such that the number of age, edges is not greater than cn. So it's, yeah, and actually this was, ascension was maybe, no, which was noticed by Pinsker. So it's the kind to prove the existence of such C, so it's relatively easy, and it follows by, by, by some kind of standard probabilistic argument. So there was, in combinatorics, so probably it's our, maybe the first, this probabilistic type arguments were introduced by Erdős in many decades ago, and so here it can be apply it and to get this statement. So it's, this is about the existence. Now, to get explicit, it turns out that to get explicit construction, so some, actually it involves some sophisticated mathematics. And so first construction, so this, apparently I was the first who gave the first explicit construction of the, expand of this statement. And then there's a Gaber and Galil and probably some others. And It was about 1973-75, and it was, so some of the subjects which are, were involved, so there was, okay, unitary representations, and in particular, there was a property T of Kajdan, now there's uh, Kelly graphs, there's uh, infinite groups of uh, finite fields. So certainly I don't have time to, uh, so actually each of these topics deserves a separate lecture and so, and so I, we will not 
do that. So it's now there's a decade later. So there was some other construction of some properties which are better than some spectral properties which are better than the in the original explicit construction so it's again so these constructions were kind of obtained independently by myself and they, by Lubotsky Philip Sarnak so it was approximately 1984 88, 1988 and actually it uses uh, probably more complicated subjects than in this first constructions. Yeah, no, so there is a quaternion of the periodic numbers, so it's Michael Atti described what quaternions are. They were introduced by Hamilton, but they were of the real numbers, so it's, we have A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, with usual relations ij is minus ji equal to k and then we by circle we rotate this relation and then there's a usual multiplications a b c in g are real numbers so but then one can consider also all the periodic numbers so it's maybe just probably not Everybody here knows what periodic numbers are, so it's so p is a prime, so it's so usually real numbers are written in decimal expansion, so from left to the right. Now is p prime number p is ten, so ten of course is not a prime, but if we write some this decimal expansion from right to the left, then we get periodic numbers. So it's, of course, we should replace 10 by digits between so 0, 1 to p minus 1. Okay, and then there is a theory of arithmetic groups. So then there is, a, okay, I didn't write. So there's a Buryatid's trees, and actually, and then something very advanced. So there was a Jacqueline Glenn's theorem from the theory of automorphic forms. Then there was a, there was a famous conjecture by Patterson and Ramanujan. Again, it's about some spectrum of certain operators in the theory of automorphic forms, which was proved by Deligne. So it's actually very advanced mathematics. So it's some of, Janus, for example, when I proved that there's a this expanders with these properties I refer to this Raman Patterson conjecture. So it's Lubotsky, Phillips, Sarnak initially also did that, but later they were able to somewhat simplify the proof and use only kind of less complicated mathematics. So it's uh, yeah, probably there's about 10 minutes left, so it's just... Uh, and I maybe want to make some maybe personal remarks. So it's... Yeah, no, so I, uh, so my... So after I go
got my PhD or even slightly before that, I started to work in the Institute for the Problems Information Transmission of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And so then it's there where these people, Sopinski and Vasilega and when Pinsky did his construction and then there was some existence of expanders with certain with some estimates on the number of edges. So he didn't have this explicit construction, so and I was able to do that. In some sense it was kind of, you know, in, in, okay, in uh, m many surveys of this, my contributions is considered as a breakthrough, but in some sense it was a luck, so it, it was in the right place, in the right time, and also I had certain background. Actually, I was in the right place for a wrong reason, but I don't want to elaborate on that. So it's, in fact, it was, I was quite, so from this point of view, it, I was quite lucky, so it's, and, so I, actually, I, I also wanted to do, do Pure Mathematics, so Institute for Problems Information Transmission. So they had quite many mathematicians, but it was not exactly a mathematical institute, and there was some kind of pressure to do something more applied. And then, so in some sense, because of this pressure, I, made these contributions, so it's, yeah, probably it's not the most, not what I consider my most important contribution to mathematics, but probably is the best known. Now it's, let me, so probably I am old enough to give some advice to young mathematicians and, okay, you can consider this as a joke, but uh, so it's, uh, once I watched TV, TV, there was an interview with some former member of the British government. He was also a member of the House of Lords and he gave an advice to young people who wanted to become politicians. And he said that before going to politics, you should make some money. <laughs> so it's kind of an analog of this so to maybe some advice to young before starting to develop some grand theories, you should solve some hard problems. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your nice talk and also for somehow giving an example that sometimes being in the wrong place can turn out right for something. So I think it's a very good advice for young people. So we have um, short time for a question. So is there someone? Who, yeah, there's a question there and there's one. Hello. Uh, so I'm the computer scientist, so I don't know math, but I'm going a little I don't know, like, pure math in a high level. But I'm working with, with a lot of data, uh, graph, graph, graph data, 
I can't help but thinking that related to computer science. So could you give some hints that any application to the computer science to this? No, 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 it's a, yeah, so there was a, you know, so how one of the properties of this uh, expander graphs that you can reach quite fast from one uh, from one vertex to another, and so the, there was a quite interch. Okay, so the, there's a, some of it okay, very well connected. So it's probably it's it, it, probably that's the reason why it's somehow it's. Uh, related to many problems in theoretical computer science. Yes, there's one more. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned Dan Spielman at the beginning of your talk, and in Marcus Spielman's Rosso's proof of the Cass and Singer conjecture, they give a probabilistic proof of the existence of uh, these bipartite Ramanujan graphs. So no explicit construction is known as of now. So I was just wondering whether you could comment on the pitfalls between going from a probabilistic proof to an explicit construction of these expander type graphs. No, but, but uh, no, that was a probabilistic, uh, no, uh, now, probabilistic is not a construction, so it's, you know, okay, you can, uh, if you start to construct kind randomly, then with very high probability you get an expander. But you are, but explicit constructions will give. Yeah, so what, what makes it difficult to go from the probabilistic version to the, expand, to the explicit construction? I was just wondering if there was like an intuitive reason why. No, 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 no it's, yeah, no, okay, so there was uh, what is called now, yeah, no, so there was a construction which is based on the use of quaternions and they have this Ramanujan properties and So it's, but uh, then it's the regular graphs where you have p plus one, uh, where the degree p plus one, where p is a prime number, and there is some kind of best possible estimate for the spectrum. Yeah, no, so relatively recently, so it's Dan Spielman proved that uh, it's possible to do this for, I think, for every degree. But his construction is kind of mixed. It's, so he chooses some ensemble of graphs and then shows that with high probability it will be this graph which, graphs which has this spectral estimate. So that's what? I think his question was more in general, why sometimes you have a probabilistic argument that something exists, but it's very hard to find no, 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 an no. explicit construction. And no, no, yeah, yeah no, so actually, usually to show the existence using probabilistic methods, somehow it's kind of much easier yeah. than to give an explicit construction. Actually, want to sh mention the following. You know, actually, I, I forgot to say that rather recently it was discovered by Gut and Gromov that several years before the paper of Pinsky, there was a paper by Kolmogorov and Barzin about some brain models, and they actually they used some constructions which have certain expanded, uh, similar expanded properties, and but 
somehow this paper by Komak and Bazen was not actually expert in this. Pinsker and Basaliga, they didn't know when I told Basaliga okay, several years ago about this kind of, this paper by Komak and Bazen, he said he know he was not aware of that, but then he looked at the paper, paper and he said there was a, something like expanders. But Pinsky certainly didn't know about the paper, and Basilega didn't know. So now it's... Yeah, no, so, so, so also this construction of Catania, so there was a kind of related problems of finding graphs of our short cycles. And, for example, we take regular graphs with, with degree P plus one and, and vertices that is shown by the barbaristic method that the, it's, there is a low estimate for possible graphs. It's less than log P, log N, log P N. But for this explicit construction, there is this better estimate. There is a, the factor 4 over 3 log Pn. And actually, this number 4 over 3, I don't know, it's probably some numerology, but also occurs in the... the there was a Mandelbrot conjecture about Hausdorff dimensions of uh, uh, random non-self-intersecting paths, and there is, which was proved by Schramm, and actually there's also this factor one of four of the three. Okay. So thank you very much. And